We're here with the Wolf of Wall Street, Jordan. Sales action, amazing conference. Ryan, it's great to have you in Monaco. These guys are the best. The knowledge that they both bring is amazing. Motivating salespeople is pretty straightforward. It's right. about money, power, freedom, and um, incentivizing them is also pretty easy because you do it through money, right? Through commissions. But how did you manage to keep good people who are not in direct sales jobs, like those crucial people around you, like right now you have Marissa, right? And uh, all these people around you who you value a lot. Mm -hmm. How do you find a compensation structure that motivates them to stay, gives them room to improve, mm -hmm and also doesn't hurt the business because you're taking away too much of the... In the case of, you know, like people like, like for example, a personal assistant like you mentioned, or someone like Matt, someone like who's very, you know, who, who really runs businesses for me and really is very integral in my operation. How do you keep people like that? Well, number one is, is that um, I, I personally am very generous. So one thing is I'm a big believer in hiring people and paying them the high side of the wage, for sure, right? That's number one. Number two is I always believe in paying bonuses at the end of each year. And, um, and like, for example, in the case of someone like Matt, who's like the CEO of my company, the president of my company, right? You know, I'm going to pay him, I pay him a very generous base. And I also, what I do is I personally engage in a lot of venture capital deals. And I allow Matt to participate. I give him a free carry in those deals but provided that he stays with me, he invests over five years. So if he leaves before the five years, he loses his stake. So you know, one of the things you can do in your own businesses with people is you create an employer, like these sort of incentives where you give people bonuses, but they're, it, they have to vest over time. So you give them some deferred compensation. Now there's certain laws that if they've earned the compensation, you can't take it back from them if they leave. But what you can take is the matching portion back. So what you do is, like, for example, if you have a situation where you're going to have, let's say, um, someone um, as, as $100,000, I'm just making up a round number, $100,000 salary, and you give them a $20,000 bonus that vests over time. That meeting, it's like sort of a profit participation on top of, it, you, you can't make it related to the number of hours they work or else you might get into a problem with your legally because they're gonna say they earned it and have to get it. But you, you have them, you put money in these plans that they have to stay for a certain number of years to collect the money. That's one way. Another really powerful way to, to keep people, and this is great for commission-based salespeople, right, is to give people compensation plans that have residuals attached to them. So like if they open up a client, then they get to get residuals on the client. Rather than compensating them all at once, you'll have to make money over the client over time. So they have a book of business, so to speak. But if they leave you, they lose their book of business. So it's, at, for example, at Stratton, you used to say, you know, you know, if, you know, when you leave some companies, you get a golden parachute, right? When you leave Stratton, you get a golden shower. You piss all over you because we'd literally destroy your book. Like, we would go and I would take your book and give it to 10 different people. And you ever see, remember when we Jerry Maguire? Remember when he gets fired from this place in the beginning of the movie? And they give out his client list to like eight other agents. They attack his business and they steal all his clients. So it makes the pain of separation from a company very, very severe if someone knows they're gonna lose all their clients, right? Another question that I have gotten from the audience is when you, first start off, right, you're running the sales operations and you're the best sales, sales person on the team and everybody respects you because they look up to you. Now, did you ever get into the situation of where somebody started to make, like be better at sales or closing more volume than you? And when it happened, like how did you deal with still retaining respect from that person and them not- Never doing happened. It? Never. <laughs> <laughs> but that's me. No, it never happened. No one, I, I never, I never, no matter how great a salesman was, they never felt like they were better than me. That, that, that was me, right? And that was sort of my, and, and by the way, that might exist, like, for example, if you're running an engineering firm and you're the best engineer out there and the engineers might respect, like, they, no matter how great the engineers, they always thought that Steve Jobs was, was better than them. You find, like, and I think it's, a, it's not just me, but in a lot of companies, you have one specialty. Now, just by the way, that doesn't mean that everyone in the accounting department thought I was a better accountant than them or better marketer than them, but in my one core skill set that I'm known most for, I was the best at that. Now, you don't have to necessarily be the best to get respect from your sales force. That's not what it's about. 
okay? What it's about is if you have, it's, it's like, it's leading by example. And also, it's also the myth of, of what you were. At a certain point, what happens is everybody at some point stops actively selling and closing and becomes more of a manager or becomes, you know, you know, a CEO, so to speak. And a lot of it comes like the myth of what this person once was and building on the myth and how you position yourself. And, you know, and over time, people almost want to build you up as a mythical character, right? And so, you know, it's not very difficult for you as a CEO to maintain the respect of your sales force, provided you once did the job really, really well. You know, whether you're the top producer at your company or the best salesman in the world, I mean, it depends, how, you know, listen, there were people at Stratton that ended up producing a lot more than I did because I transitioned off the phone within a year. Like I was done. I, I, I had bigger fish to fry than to make calls every single day. I was managing thousands of people and doing investment banking deals, right? So I never did 15 million in commission in one year, right? But I closed the most sales in one month. And at any given time, I could grab the phone. This is the most important thing of all. At any given time, I could grab the phone from any salesman and close the deal better than they could. Or stand up and coach someone through a sale and just sound so good when I coach them, like, fuck, like that, blown away. So it's not always the biggest producer, so to speak, right? Because a, a person that's running a company, you're not actively producing anymore, okay? And so much of it, again, is in, you know, this sort of daily reinforcing. If you're up there and you're training them and you sound good and you're great, they will respect you. No one's going to say, well, you know, you only, in your best year, you only did a million nine. I did two million one. I've lost my respect for you, right? Companies change over time. It gets easier to make money. It gets harder to make money. So you're, you're not always comparing apples to apples anyway. But I, I, I wouldn't say that you have to be the absolute, you know, being the best at, at, in the world or something is not the only thing required to get respect from people. You can have enough, if you're you know, good enough and proficient, can be good enough sometimes. And that's something interesting that you said where like, your guys knew that any time that you wanted to grab the phone, you could and still do it better than them. So they had right. that awareness. And had there, were there any situations where you like, tactically felt like, okay, I gotta remind them? And, and you, you brought in like a huge investment banking deal and you like showed it to everybody and like, like brought it in like a winning trophy to remind everybody? Was it, was it, was it something look, that look you guys, I mean, I'll be honest with you. Like I invented a system that changed everyone's life. No one ever doubted my ability. Like it was, I was so far ahead. It's me. I, I created the straight line system which fueled everything at Stratton. Everything was based on this system. Before the system, they couldn't close after they could close. So they were just, everyone was so grateful for this system I created, it changed everyone's life and created everything else around it. So that, that never came up. I never had to remind them how good I was. It was more about like, you know, reminding them how many lewds I could take. No, seriously, it's still, it's, it, it, like the sales was out of the question. It did it, like it was so far beyond, like they were so, like the legend of my ability to close was so, Like the tail was so tall, probably even taller than reality. You, you get it? They used to call it sprinkling fairy dust. What that means is like people would be on the phone in the early days before it got so big. I used to actually walk around the boardroom and coach people on calls. Like they'd be on the calls, almost there, but they couldn't. And I would sit there and feed them lines and they called it, you sprinkle fairy dust on me. And like I, you know, help them transition into a smooth close, right? That stuff was legendary at Stratton. Like that was, that wasn't questioned, you know? What really was far more important was, was the ability to keep all these big egos in check and functioning as a team. It was really about that more than anything. And we did things like we, listen, there were many times when I said we did these sort of sacrificial firings, we did public executions like once a month. We call them public executions. If there was a big producer that started to get too cocky, get the fuck out. Bye. We don't need you. Next. I got 300 people a month signing up here eager to take your desk. We had more salesmen than desks. So if you came in late to work, you didn't have a desk to sit at. You get, that was the mindset of Stratton. 
So we, 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 we have this, this, this is an aggressive growth strategy. Now, again, let's take it to this utmost extreme. There's versions along the way that are more balanced, but I, I think this idea that of, of, of like, I think what the problem that some of you are facing is when you're small and staying stagnant, it is difficult for anyone to manage that sales force because every one person feels so valued and you're almost living in fear of losing them versus when you're growing from the bottom up, knowing once you have the confidence that you can replace any salesman in your room, you will manage your sales force more effectively and more aggressively. All right, that's, that's, that's uh, also very interesting because we teach that all the time also in our tactics. So you guys listen, Jordan's talking about the same stuff that we always tell you. <laughs> True or false, did you actually hire midgets to throw them at a board when so, celebrating? That's complicated, yeah? <laughs> You know, you know, midget tossing is, is, is actually considered a crime by the uh, United Nations. <laughs> That's true. But they outlawed it in like 1995. I think I did it in 91, though. But anyway, but, but still, we didn't, it didn't start off that way. What happened was we hired midgets, right? We had these, used to have these wild parties in the Hamptons, in, this, in the beach, right? We had like 3,000 people. It was fucking full-on craziness, right? And we had the midgets... We hired midgets to walk around with sombreros. And we put chips and dip. You get it? Like chips and dip. Uh, dip in the middle, chips. And, and the midgets were walking by with like peanuts and cheese. <laughs> it seemed innocent enough, you know, at the time. <laughs> but then like most things with Stratton, it's always like, what's next? Like, what's next? Right? Like, like for example, with the head shavings, it's true. We start off with shaving people's heads. We start with one guy who had this great head of hair, right? And like, you know, and he was like struggling a little bit in the beginning, right? So we paid him $10,000 to shave his head. And we got a barber shop pole. We made a, we made a whole big deal over this thing, right? And that was amazing. We all clapped and cheered and fucking hooted. And, right? But then like flash forward six months later, I'm like, okay, I'll give you $100 to shave your head. It's like not that the thrill is gone. So what do you do next? Let's shave a girl's head. So that's why we, and that's true, in the movie we shaved the girl's head and we paid her 10 grand for a breast job, to get a breast job, right? So that was like cool, we thought. And then, you know, so we on and on it goes. So with the midgets, once we did start off, we hired midgets a few times to do, attend parties, you know, and then ultimately it was like, well, what's next, right? And they came with the idea of, of throwing the midgets. Like, but it wasn't really at a dartboard. It wasn't like that. It was not like that at all. But consider that to be too dangerous, right? This is more like a, a diving competition. Well, like you had people holding up signs, like, you know, 10, 9, like, they, so you had, we had three girls in bathing suits, bikinis, sitting there on the fucking stools holding up judge cards, like judging the toss based on distance, style, and the whole thing, right? But I was not there for that. I strategically missed that day. But that's the story of midget tossing.